you doing? Good morning. Good morning. I like deja vu all over again. <laughs> Good morning and thank you all for joining us this morning. Today I'm very pleased to announce a salute to our veterans and to our service members and a parade that's going to be held here in our capital city. Uh, my office has been working in conjunction with the Iowa Department of Veterans Affairs and the Iowa National Guard to organize this, what we think will be a great event, to honor and recognize and show our appreciation for the men and women who have served our country and those that continue to serve from the state of Iowa. The parade will be similar to what we did in 1991, welcome home the soldiers after the first war in the Gulf, and I wore this uniform at that time. It's the same uniform that I wore when I was in service, 69 to uh, 71. Um, it's important that we honor and show our appreciation to those that continue to make the sacrifice to protect uh, freedom throughout the world. As a former member of the Army and now as Commander-in-Chief of the Iowa National Guard, I'm very proud of the men and women that represent our state on the battlefields across the world and also serve us in times of disaster here at home. Uh, we, in fact, we're welcoming back the Air Guard unit this afternoon, uh, and uh, as you know, we had a lot of our Army National Guard uh, come back last year after having the biggest deployments of, of the uh, Iowa Army National Guard since World War II. So at this point, I'm pleased to turn it over to our outstanding State Adjutant General, uh, General Timothy Orr. Thanks, Governor. Ladies and gentlemen, a salute to our veterans and our service members parade will begin at 10 a.m. on Saturday, 30th of June, here in downtown Des Moines. The parade is to honor nearly the 230,000 veterans and more than 15,000 currently serving military members and their military families. This is a tremendous opportunity for our Iowans to celebrate their veterans, the service members, their families, and the rich military tradition and history, and to show the respect for those who gave their ultimate life in the ultimate sacrifice for our country. Iowa has a long and proud military tradition dating back 175 years to the beginning of the Iowa Territory in the 1830s. Iowa has served in every major conflict since the Mexican War of 1846, and the proud heritage continues today around the globe in every branch of the military service. You know, we're very fortunate to be able to live in a state where our citizens show respect for our military, their service, their honor, and their families. This year marks a very special celebration of the official commemoration of the 150th anniversary of the Civil War, the 60th anniversary of the Korean War, and the 50th anniversary of the Vietnam War, all of which have a special representation within the parade. The parade will start at the Capitol, and it will travel west on Grand Avenue, and then it will turn north on 2nd Avenue to the Veterans Memorial Community Choice, excuse me, Choice, Choice Credit Union Convention Center. The parade is free to all the public. We invite you to attend, bring your families, Governor Branstead, Lieutenant Governor Reynolds, members of the Iowa Congressional Delegation, and the prominent elected military and official leaders of our communities will be on the post receiving and reviewing all the floats and all the, uh, the entries of the parade. You will get a chance to see police escorts. You'll see the riderless horse. We'll have numerous color guards, units around all the services within the state. We'll see a lot of variety of equipment, veterans, families, and probably our employers. Thank you. Well, as was already said, thank you very much for being here this morning. Um, there's been a lot of interest in this event. I've had a number of phone calls and been um, expressing interest. In fact, I had two yesterday of people that really want to be involved in it. So we're working really hard to put the details together, and uh, soon this morning um, uh, we will be putting out the application process, the letters of uh, welcome to all those that want to be a part of it. And we just hope that uh, everybody will come out on Saturday, the 30th of June, and and be part of the celebration to honor all of our veterans, all of our service members that are still wearing the uniform and, and 
just uh, salute all those who have done so much for all of us so that all of us can live the way we do in this great state and this great nation. Um, you know, as, as General Orr mentioned, uh, the anniversaries, um, when I look back to my great great granddad, was in the Civil War, he started as a private dinner a company commander marching down Pennsylvania Avenue, and then you know, looking at all the friends that served in Korea and then those that, you know, from Vietnam. And, and a lot of those are the ones that really stepped it up to the plate and really want to make this a really neat celebration for the community. So thank you to Governor Branstad for having the idea and, and providing the leadership to it and General Orr for uh, asking me to be part of this and help uh, lay the groundwork and put the plan together and execute it so that we just have a great celebration for all of our veterans and service members. Thank you. Retiring Colonel King, uh, as you know, as a former, um, I always, always say, voice of the Iowa National Guard, and also was my driver in that 91 parade. So, And also, I would point out, yesterday I was at the, uh, the Jewish Life Center, and this week is also a Jewish Veterans <coughs> Week in the state of Iowa. And we honor a lot of Jewish veterans as well, and, and they've done a great job of uh, putting together historical information about the Jewish people of Iowa, and I signed a special proclamation for this week, the Jewish Veterans Week in Iowa. And now the Lieutenant Governor has an announcement on another subject. Do you want to see if there's any questions? Oh. Well, when, okay. when we go ahead, then we'll... Oh, okay. We'll... He gets to say. Well, good morning. We have one more uh, announcement that we want to share with you this morning, and that's the President's Committee on the uh, Arts and Humanities announced that Finley Elementary School in Des Moines has been selected to participate uh, in a new arts education initiative to help turn around low-performing schools. It was developed in cooperation with the U.S. Department of Education and the White House Domestic Policy Council. The Turnaround Arts Initiative is a new public-private partnership designed to narrow the achievement gap and to improve student engagement through the arts. Finley was chosen to be one of eight schools featured in the program through a highly competitive national selection process and will receive intensive arts education resources, expertise, expertise, and the involvement of high-profile President Committee artists over the course of two years to support their educational reform efforts. In the announcement, Margo Lyon, co-chair of the President's Committee on the Arts and the Humanities, praised uh, Finley Elementary Principal Tara Owen, stating, Ms. Owen and her team have a dynamic new vision for Finley, which importantly includes the vital role of the creative arts to engage learning and academic success. We look forward to helping their vision become a reality. Uh, an, ex an external evaluation will measure the impact and the effectiveness of using rigorous and integrated arts education together with other educational reform efforts in high po poverty, low performing school districts. Uh, in addition to being recipients of the school improvement grant, criteria for selection included demonstrating need and opportunity, strong school leadership with district support, and a commitment to arts education. The governor and I are proud of Finley Elementary School, and we look forward to watching their progress in this program. So now we're going to yeah, take, we're take your questions. <laughs> On, 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 the, on the veterans uh, event on the 30th, or we're on the announcement with regard to the school receiving one of the eight uh, awards that were announced today. Do you, know how, do you know how much money Finley gets in this grant? We'll get back to you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Actually, this was something that we did uh, in, at the request of the, of the White House, basically, with regard to. Uh, the program. So there's eight schools in the nation that are getting this, and uh, I think what they're going to do is uh, work. Uh, well, they'll have visiting artists that will work directly with them, and so and and they are getting financial support. We can find out the exact. General or Colonel, could you talk about um, in light of this parade? You know, we've seen Afghanistan and the Iraqi conflicts go on for so long. Do you think, as a whole, the public is appreciative enough? of the folks coming back, as they come back from war, are we better than we were in generations past, the Vietnam era, that kind of thing, or is there more we have to work on? You know, I, uh, I'm i blessed uh, in this state to, uh, to tell you that I think uh, we have tremendous support. Uh, we have since the beginning of the war for the last 10 years. Um, 
you know, I think the parade is special because not only is it going to recognize those that have continued to uh, serve and are serving now, and, and we've had great welcome homes and send-offs, but I think there's a generation there uh, from the Vietnam era that, that I think this parade's going to have a special meaning. It's an opportunity for us to say welcome home to, to that generation that didn't receive the same type of uh, accolades and more important respect that uh, this generation has served today. As, as a veteran of the Vietnam era, I would totally concur with what uh, General Moore has to say. Uh, and as governor, I've gone to a lot of these events, and I can tell you the response and appreciation and respect that is evident in Iowa today is very good and very strong. Uh, and, and I'm appreciative of that. But I think many of the veterans of the Korean and Vietnam era didn't get that kind of really respect and appreciation when they came home. And so it's a way for us to let them know how much we appreciate them as well. On the tours of the Capitol, one of the pictures they stop in front of is a picture of, uh, I think it's an encampment here of veterans right. over a century ago. Is there some effort to take a mass picture at this event? Mm. Oh, that's a good question. Yeah. A mass picture? I don't know. Uh, I think there's a, a picture of World War One veterans is that that, that uh, was was taken uh, here at the Capitol grounds, which is a pretty interesting picture. Uh, that's a good question. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do that kind of reference the picture. No, I think uh, the effort and energy to take to get all those soldiers and airmen uh, and all our service members together will be a challenge. But we did do something very similar to that picture when the Second Brigade Combat Team uh, and the First of the 133 Infantry when they went to Iraq back in 07, um, they did uh, a picture that uh, is remnant of the Second Red Bull uh, patch, and uh, it is out there today. And you can see that. The cost of this event will be and how it will be. Yeah, all the money is being raised privately as we did in '91. Uh, there's a committee that's been working on that. Uh, the, the cost will be, I think, minimal, uh, but there will be some costs, you know, for uh, police and things like that um, for the event. Most of it is being done by volunteers. Uh, I don't know if we have any more information on that. <coughs> the governor's correct in, in the. Uh, Private, private donations have, have come forward to take care of those costs, and, and I'm working in amassing those and take care of them. And, and, uh, there won't be any state money involved in the, in the production of the parade, so we're very, very fortunate for that, and we're very happy that these people have stepped up and, and offered their resources to take care of them. Just for clarification, I understand the 150-year connection of the Civil War and the 60-year Korean. Uh, I don't get the 50-year Vietnam. Okay. You know, I'm glad you asked that the 50 year anniversary is uh, just now Memorial Day weekend. The Department of Defense and then actually the government is going to be coming out with a two year program uh, in recognition of Vietnam veterans. And uh, so we saw this as an anniversary of the war, but more important, it's, it's about uh, the nation coming together to try to close some of the, what I would think is some of the heartache with the way that the war was. Uh, and more important, how we brought those service members home. And so you're going to see not only in Iowa, but you're going to see all over the nation starting on Memorial Day weekend uh, and a proclamation signed on behalf of Vietnam veterans, an effort to go forth to uh, around the country and do the proper thing for our Vietnam veterans. 50 years ago, it was 1962. That's right. That, that, well, it started in 62 during the Kennedy administration. Uh, that's when the... Uh, War in Vietnam started. You, you may recall, uh, you know, the, the the French had left, and and uh, uh, we uh, we uh, came in to support the, the South Vietnamese government during that time, and, and then it was gradually escalated, uh, you know, throughout the 60s. Uh, and, and I guess the, the heaviest fighting was probably in the late 60s, uh, and, and went into the 70s, but. Uh, it started in 62, and I think that's, um, in terms of uh, the groups like the VFW and American Legion, in terms of recognizing people that served during times of conflict, I think 62 is the date that's used. So it's the official date. Other questions? Yeah, go ahead. Let me just add a little bit to that. Um, the Department of Defense is the leader on those commemorative periods. So, uh, 
different points in the anniversary, in the, in the time since a major conflict, DOD would specify a two, three, or five year commemorative period as the uh, recognizing the anniversary of those various conflicts. I remember you know, prior to my retirement, I uh, was dealing with the uh, five year commemorative period for the anniversary of World War II, as a, for instance. So this is a very light thing for, for uh, Vietnam. Well, I also want to uh, recognize and honor a member of the press corps who I understand is going to be retiring, and that is Mike Glover. Mike's been a real stalwart here over a long period of time, and we're going to miss you, Mike, and we want to congratulate you on your long and outstanding service uh, uh, to the people uh, serving in the press corps and also on Iowa Press. And anyway, we wish you the very best in your retirement. <laughs> governor, we can, Same, governor, we can either get a mannequin or a dummy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mike actually goes back to the breeding cell phone era. <laughs> <laughs> so do I. So go ahead. <laughs> um, I understand that, that you were behind uh, some of the decisions to, to scrap the workforce development pilot part of the program and continue to offer assistance at the Des Moines office to people have trouble with unemployment claims. Why? Well, first of all, we were not informed as to uh, what was going on, and we thought it was important that as we work through this, and the state of Iowa actually uh, is behind a lot of other states in terms of using uh, technology to better serve uh, the needs of people that are seeking jobs. And so the department is, I think, trying to do the right thing, but we think that uh, uh, there, there also needs to be a human element to it as well. And, and so in those, uh, I think it's 16 uh, one-stop service areas, we think it is important to have that available as well. But, you know, for the jobs of, of the era that we're in today, you need to be able to deal with technology, and we need to help people learn how to work with technology, because even, in, you know, we've had some real great success in, growing jobs in manufacturing here in the last year, but those jobs today are much different than the factory jobs of 20, 30 years ago, and they do require the use of technology and working with technology. So we want to work with the job applicants on that, and so we, we think that uh, uh, we can do that, and we think the department is moving in the right direction, but this particular thing we thought was something that uh, was not a, uh, we didn't, we wanted to make sure that that personal element is also part of delivering this important service. Down the road, like a couple years down the road, do you see something like this happening, or is that off the table? No, I, I think we're going to continue to see more use of technology, and we need to work with people to be able to feel more comfortable in using <coughs> technology, because the jobs require it. So that can be part of preparing people for the jobs. You know, right now, and in fact, your paper did an article yesterday on, on the fact that we have a lot of jobs that are available, but we don't have people with the right skill set. So, so we're, we really need to make sure that uh, people are upgrading their skills for the jobs of the future. Uh, it's not the workforce that we had 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and having you know, gone to places like John Deere or, or to the uh, Bridgestone Firestone Tire Plant here in Des Moines, and uh, having been there many years ago and then being there again now, a much different workplace. Uh, we were just at uh, Ellison. the Ellison in, in Council Bluffs. This was really interesting because uh, they are making, um, they are basically providing, what the hell at the Lieutenant Governor? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's exciting. I'll put a shameless plug in for the STEM Advisory Council because that's exactly one of its missions is to really increase achievement and, and uh, uh, for, for STEM initiatives. But we were in Ellison and they have robots and so they provide solutions for companies all across the state of Iowa. Now you're going to talk about the company yeah, because you were right. there yeah. as he was sitting there. Uh, he was familiar with the company, but uh, it's a great company. They're working with community college over there as well as high schools. 
to really put to, in place a two-year um, degree that trains workers in that area to provide the uh, workforce that they need for their business. So they provide solutions for companies like John Deere and all across the state of Iowa, the near, uh, based on the robot that they ship in. Right. And the robot is the new, it's F-A-N-U-C. And after I'd been there a little while, I said, wait a minute, I've been in that factory in Japan that makes the robots 20 years ago. So it's pretty amazing, but, but what Ellison's doing is making the solution. So just having the robot doesn't do you any good right. if, if you, you don't have the solution and how it can be used to help improve your processes in your manufacturing facility, and that's what they do. As far as like the $3 million of workforce development, I was saying that this, that move would potentially, if, if, if at all 16 places would save $3 million of the $5 million they're expecting to lose. What? We're going to, well, first of all, not only in workforce development, but throughout state government where we get substantial federal dollars, we need to be prepared for significant uh, reduction in federal funding. Because when you have a federal government that's racking up more than a trillion dollar increase in the national debt every year, and 40% of the money they're spending is borrowed money, we know that's not sustainable. That's not going to continue. And so we're going to have to find ways to be able to deliver these services in better and more efficient manner. And so we just, we need to do that throughout state government. And we're telling all the agencies and departments of state government, the state's not going to be able to pick up all that federal money that's lost. We're going to have to find ways to try to be able to deliver the services in a more efficient way, knowing full well that we're going to see the amount of federal dollars reduced. And I expect over the foreseeable future that's what's going to happen. Your Republican colleagues upstairs don't like the concept of what they say, picking winners and losers in economic development grants and all this. And they're particularly concerned about the bill that you signed, the Field of Dreams tax break. Are you concerned? Well, they passed it. They passed it, right. right. But some of your Republicans... <laughs> they passed it. I mean, uh, they, they, here's the thing. Okay. For anything to become law, it has to pass by a constitutional majority in the House and Senate. It did. I happen to think that Field of Dreams is a wonderful thing. Uh, I, I love it, you know. You know that line in Field of Dreams, is this heaven? No, it's Iowa. Uh, and I guess, uh, I think uh, the couple that has purchased this uh, facility has some significant plans to grow uh, this facility to attract more tourists. Uh, and, and I've been on that field. I know it's a magical place. I know if people come from all over the world to see it, I think the plans they have for it can enhance and improve it. And uh, they want to do similar to what was done with the racetrack in Newton. Similar financing mechanism was authorized for that. It's been successful. Uh, and so I felt it was an appropriate thing to do. I think the larger argument is that this kind of runs contradictory to your bigger um, picture of, of reforming the tax code, that you know there's individual winners and losers at some point. Is this, is this an exception? Well, I think you have to look at each and every one of these on its own merits and decide. Generally, our goal is to reduce the regulatory and tax burden and make Iowa more competitive for everybody across the board. But we also recognize sometimes you have to compromise and you have to work with other people to get things done. We have a split legislature. We're doing the same thing on property taxes as well. Uh, you know, I. Uh, if you want to say, well, we want the perfect, ideal solution, you may not get anything. On the other hand, if you can make substantial progress to reducing the tax burden, reducing the regulatory burden, making Iowa more attractive for investment and creating good jobs, I think that's what we should be doing. And you're and talking more broader scope in your... Uh, I am looking at the big picture. Yeah. And I understand there are some people that maybe are looking at it from a more uh, puristic point of view. But I guess I would point out, I guess a good example of this, there's probably no more competitive state in terms of tax structure than South Dakota. <coughs> but nevertheless, and, and I can tell you that Debbie Durham and I worked very, very hard to try to get this Bell Cheese factory in Iowa. It ended up in South Dakota. It wasn't just the tax structure. They provided about $21 million in incentives that also helped attract them to South Dakota. Now, even though South Dakota is very, very competitive, they also felt a need to provide some incentives in addition to that. So in the world that we live in today, which is a very competitive world economy, 
I don't think that we can say that we can live without providing some incentive. I will say, our incentive packages are usually very modest, much more modest than what South Dakota did there and a lot of other states have done. But nevertheless, as we continue to make Iowa more competitive, reducing the tax and regulatory burdens, I think we still need to have the opportunity and the ability to provide some incentives when we're competing for these important and critical jobs. Do you have an agreed upon number in terms of the 20 million that you asked for for incentives? Uh, 25 is I think what we recommended uh, and we're continuing to work through that process with the legislature and we're very hopeful that uh, we can see that and other things that you know we also have the uh, um, we have a number of other uh, things in our in our jobs initiative that's before the legislature, the commercial industrial property tax, uh, the, uh, the uh, ESOP, the employee stock option plan. Uh, we are hopeful that these things can all be approved here before the legislature adjourns. Is there anything that is appropriate for the state to do regarding bullying in light of that young man's death and print card? Well, the state is already do, doing a number of things. Uh, we have a law that requires every school district to have a plan to deal with bullying. And we do have an annual conference on that. And, 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 that, and I can tell you that uh, Beth Townsend, representing the Civil Rights uh, Commission, attended that conference uh, last year and has reported to me about it. Uh, I think we need to continue to look at how we can be even more effective in making sure that school districts know their responsibility and that they take the problems very, very seriously. Uh, I think over 600 people attended the conference. Uh, I want to see us do more in the future. I want to make sure the Department of Ed is doing all it can to inform and prepare school districts to effectively deal with the challenges that occur with bullying. It's even worse today because of uh, social media. In the old days, it would be a kid on a in the school grounds uh, or you know in, in the playground or maybe in the hallway but now you have that and then you have all this stuff that's going on uh, on in the social media and that is i think made it even worse it's just having a plan enough i mean it should be no i think you have to not only have a plan you need to know how to deal with it effectively and that's why you need to have uh, you need to teach people okay when you when this occurs how you combat it, how you deal with it, who you report it to, and all that sort of stuff. And you need to make sure that uh, when it does it, that, that there is follow-up. Who's making sure there is follow-up? Well, the Department of Ed has, I, I, um, they have information on, on this. And every school district is required to have a plan. And I think it's probably appropriate for us to review those plans and see how effective they are and to see that school districts are indeed following those plans. It's not an easy thing, and I know, uh, you know, uh, maybe this is a, a difficult area for school districts, but it is critically important that we do everything we can to make sure that we have safety and security for all of our students uh, in the state of Iowa. For months we've heard you ask the lawmakers for a bold reform on education. By the end of this week, this is the end this week. Uh, how are you going to characterize what you get on this education reform? It, it'll be less well, it than It depends on what we get. <laughs> I mean, I think the House passed a very bold education reform initiative. It wasn't all that we asked for, but it was very significant. Uh, the Senate passed a much more watered-down version. It's now going to conference committee. Obviously, we hope that many of the key elements that were in the House uh, plan will be adopted in the conference committee. And, We'll reserve judgment until we see it in its final form. But we're going to continue to work, as is uh, um, Jason Glass and our people with the Department of Ed, to try to get as much as possible accomplished this year. And what we can't get done this year, we'll be back to try to get next year. But I want to get as much as we can done this year. I want to see us make a, a significant uh, step forward with the bold reform of our education system. Tell me quickly, Rod, and then Jason. I just wondered if over the weekend if things changed regarding property tax or the budget report where you stand coming into to this week. I'm pretty optimistic. Uh, we have a general 
agreement overall in terms of the overall budget uh, that has to be worked out through the uh, various uh, uh, conference committees that have been appointed. Uh, so there's a lot of work to be done, but I think we have a general agreement on that. And, and I think it's critically important that we do provide additional funding for higher education, including the Regents, Community Colleges, and Tuition Grant Program. Uh, obviously, the uh, jobs and the focus on economic development and having the resources to be able to be competitive in that area are important priorities that we have as we look at the budget uh, picture. But uh, I'm pretty optimistic uh, on that. And the property tax, uh, I think we have at least a general agreement uh, with the leadership on that as well, and I think it is a significant step forward that protects and reduces uh, what would happen in property tax increases in all class of property if we took no action. This would make a big difference for residential and agriculture as well as commercial and industrial. Last question. Governor, you've stated as one of your priorities in the bill that would create a public information board. Do you feel that there is a conflict between the AG representing, doing his job representing the state and, and its, its uh, uh, employees versus help representing those that are potentially uh, wronged by open records requests? Is well, a conflict there? I think there's been concern over the years about this, and that's why I think the legislation, which has now been approved by the House and is going back to the Senate, uh, it sets up a, a separate board which would have the responsibility and first of all, I think most importantly, we'll be able to give the local governments and citizens that have concerns accurate information about what they need to do to comply with and most people want to comply with the open meetings and open records law. But it also would for the first time provide the enforcement mechanism uh, for uh, enforcing violations of the open meetings and open records laws. That's something most other states have, and I believe that we should have in the state of Iowa as well. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Okay.